when we are looking about this, that uh, India continues to modernize its nuclear weapons arsenal and operationalize its growing tribe. That is its current status. It has been struggling to acquire a reliable counterforce capability. So we cannot underestimate this thing, that whether it is able or not, and as the topic suggests, temptation. So keeping in mind the topic, I identified three interlinked questions on the basis of which I tried to present my case in front of you. How one can conceptualize counterforce capability? The conceptualization is very important in this context. Second is, is India developing counterforce capability? That how we judge it or qualify that whether India is developing or we are just assuming. Are there tangible facts available about it or developments on the basis of which you say that India is doing this? And third is, of course, what is the main demand of this topic that what is the impact of counterforce on the South Asian strategic stability? Having said this, let me start with this. My first point is the counterforce. When we look about the counterforce, we say a force or doctrine of counterforce is a part of a nuclear strategy, is the targeting of an opponent's military infrastructure with nuclear strike. Now here is a question that yeah, this uh, definition which I am using, it has been taken from the Cold War nuclear strategic contest between the Russians and the Americans. But now we have to not forget, though I will stick with this definition, but uh, we have to not ignore that we are living in the third nuclear age. So analysts are using this and saying that we are in the third nuclear age and on the basis of that, when you look, for example, in the third nuclear age, how they are distinguish it from the other first one and second one is that in this age there are many capabilities by which you can develop strategic or what we call it non-nuclear strategic weapons with this uh, with the assistance of emerging technologies so in such a situation or in these kind of things even a conventional uh, weapon with integrated with the emerging technology it has an impact of the counterforce, if I can go with this third nuclear age uh, discourse, but still, let's say how we are looking in the literature and the uh, strategic community is using. So it poses a challenge to the nuclear war, which can be, uh, it poses that a nuclear war can be limited and can be found, and uh, on this basis of this, Let me finish my slides. So in this case, when we are looking at this, we find that it contains that a nuclear war can be limited and can be fought and won. So the state which is developing the counterforce within the nuclear domain, it is convinced that it, the war will remain limited or that which later on you would find that the way India is saying that it is working for the, uh, what we call it, escalation dominance or a limited war or these kind of things. So by this way, when we are looking about this counterforce, generally we are seeing that counterforce makes the use of some fraction of the nuclear force to attack a portion of the enemy's target system consisting of military installations logistical complexes, common, uh, these uh, hard bunkers or missile silos. So these kind of the things, when we focus, we find that the counterforce are going on and it is basically targeting the war fighting capability of the adversary. Of course, the, if the state acquires the counterforce capability, it gives the choice of time, target, and scale to the initiator and will pay, uh, and it uh, gives it an advantage in the uh, war. So having said this, when we look about this, my second point is that how we can go on the counterforce and on these kind of things, why we say India is preparing or is there is any logic 
there are two things. One is that what is the intention which one can, you can say, glean from India's military doctrine. There are many now available documents like 2017 Joint Forces Military Doctrine or 2018, there, what they call it, this uh, land warfare uh, doctrine. So in this context, if you can focus on their doctrine language, we find that they have an intention, they have a temptation or a desire for it. And second is that we qualify this sort of a thing with reference to their weapons acquisition or testing policy. So in this way, when we are looking, for example, how I can build this thing, if you see that the Indian military planners contemplated fighting a war against Pakistan under relative nuclear parity by acquiring escalation dominance capability after the this, uh, disappointment of 2001-2002 military deployment. And since that time, they are working on this. And similarly, in the uh, few years back, in 2017, when the Joint Services Military Doctrine was uh, revealed, one can analyze it that this doctrine was grounded on a very important sort of a thing, grounded on a on the existence of counterforce weaponry in the arsenal. Similarly, when we look about this, why I'm saying grounded before that, if you see that in the Indian literature or Indian strategic uh, discourse or statements, there was very much emphasis on the limited war. Then we heard Cold Start Doctrine, or what we call it, uh, uh, proactive military operation strategy, and that evolved into finally surgical strike strategy. So this kind of the things, especially if you see that there was a paragraph in which they talk about surgical strike in 2017 doctrine. So it means it took them one uh, 15 years, one and a half decade to reach that level. That's why I said that it was grounded, this doctrine was grounded on this. Similarly, if you see from 2017, or especially 2016 onward, one can look at, we find that the Indian ruling elite is frequently signaling interesting thing that they are talking about first use, uh, no, no first use option is no more available or uh, advisable, we have to go for first use. So if you see all these statements at their, uh, their defense ministers, you would find that, or if you review the literature, of, on the Indian CJ, uh, produced by the Indian strategic community, you would find that earlier they were too much talking about no first use of the nuclear weapon. Now they are very much uh, signaling, practically saying that first use. And that is also leads us to third point that where uh, you can say doctrinal or this kind of thing, swapping their famous massive retaliation. When they say, they are swapping with the massive retaliation with the flexible response strategy. So in this context, when we are looking massive retaliation with the flexible response, of course, that qualifies that they need this kind of a capability. Otherwise, that cannot work. Now, in this context, when we are seeing, if you see that India, if it stick with the escalation dominance concept, then India requires a seamless web of capabilities up and down on the scale of, uh, on the escalation ladder to gain escalation dominance. India needs to credible ability to disarm Pakistan of its long range nuclear weapon system to implement a strategy of escalation dominance where India can there threaten credibility to escalate and defeat Pakistan at every potential level of violence. These factors indicate that India has been determined uh, to procure or indigenously develop credible counterforce nuclear weapon uh, counterforce capa uh, counterforce capability and nuclear weapons to decapitate the striking capability of its nuclear armed adversaries, especially Pakistan, and now they are looking after Gulwan, China as well. So this leads us to a second point that if if you can theoretically or uh, you can say, find that the literature is enough to prove that India has a temptation, then where it is going or how much it has achieved. If you see India's weapon systems, in the case of weapon system, India is considering Agni-1 nuclear, 
measle, nuclear cap of a measle, for a large, and if a, because of it, it is now in a position to be deployed or launch on warning or a preemptive nuclear strike capability, or by this way they acquire the preemptive nuclear strike capability. The second important weapon in this domain is hypersonic cruise missile and hypervelocity glides projectile. So, and that link with the emerging technologies because of precision and fastness, or and uh, you can say targeting capability. The third important in this case could be the weapon, multiple independently targetable re-entry uh, re vehicles. India has been developing, they call it K-5 from Kalam K, uh, and its range could be 6,000 to uh, 10,000. That's why I said that they are also keeping in mind China now in their sort of thing. <clears throat> then you would find at the battlefield level, tactical ballistic uh, weapons, there were two in this. Prahar, which can fire, which has a solve of fire six missiles capability, range 60 to 120 kilometer, and Prakati range 60 to 170 kilometer. And besides it, though these weapons are not considered as a part of a counter force by definition, but these weapons could be considered as a prerequisite for a counter force strategy that, that is air and missile defense systems. So if you focus on the air and missile defense systems, what you find that they are generally associated with the nuclear weapons in the nuclear, uh, you can say, strategic literature because they are the sporting mechanism, but it also changes the existing <coughs> deterrence, which is based on, the, uh, you can say, vulnerabilities, preserving the vulnerabilities on the both sides. So if you have a missile defense system, then definitely it created trouble and changed the, uh, this equation. <coughs> in this context, of course, everyone knows that India has been investing too much in the development or modernization of anti-ballistic missile defense system. It sometimes makes claims about it. Of course, the workability of missile defense system is debatable. Even Americans fail to achieve any breakthrough in this field despite their billions of dollars investment. But still, if India has been investing since decades in this field, definitely they have some kind of a thinking because even weapon works or not, but if you purchase it, it brings a confidence. It, it has a psychological impact on the makers of the strategy and the users, especially the politicians. If you have studied this tactical, technical level of a strategy debate, you will find that how politicians are influenced or make a decision. So in this context, when we say the general impression is that maybe India is technologically backward and it would be not uh, in a position to do this, but we have to not forget that, as I said, that with these uh, sort of uh, things that India and the uh, United States, India is also working on the emerging technologies and everyone is aware that if I'm not wrong, on May 24 or 26, 2022, there was an, a, in a summit uh, between President Biden and uh, Pre Prime Minister Moody, where President Biden or the White House announced that the United States agreed to share artificial intelligence or the others uh, related or space technologies to the, with the India. So it is very much documented. And similarly, on 30th January 2023, the American Defense Advisor and the National Security Advisor and the Indian National Security Advisor, they had a meeting on this and which they claim that we have to go further for the implementation of that understanding between the two states. So by this way, if you see that if they are bringing the new emerging technologies in the, uh, or the Americans are assisting them, definitely it will be going to give India a capability which we find it a preemptive counterforce option or a pre capability. So operationalization of offensive missiles like hypersonic cruise missiles, uh, crystallized Agni or uh, MIRVs, coupled with air and missile defense uh, systems, enable India to launch first strike that use multiple warheads to target Pakistan's nuclear arsenal and then rely on BMD to intercept any residual assets which 
survived the disarming strike attempt. So this is a scenario which I just read in front of you. So it created alarming situation that counterforce brings closer to the use of nuclear weapons. The strategic rival might initially react by planning to launch a strategic UK's rival, I mean Pakistan, its uh, threatened missiles on warning and placing its missiles on warning or even uh, use them preemptively. So you have a three possibilities in such a scenario. First possibility is accident. Second is miscalculation. And third is uh, dis uh, desperation. So in such a situation, naturally, what is the biggest casualty? The biggest casualty of this kind of situation is, I mean, that strategic stability. So in this case, when we look about the strategic stability, it has its roots in the history of the so uh, Soviets and the Americans rivalry during the Cold War. And it was very much con uh, preserved on the mutual vulnerability emerged uh, during the Cold War uh, of the both sides. And this mutual vulnerability was a part of their, you can say, deterrent stability. If you see, that's the reason they signed 1972 ABM Treaty. So strategic stability also referred where deterrence is based, uh, deterrence stability exists, and the states avoid to change the status quo. Or they think that any initiative uh, will be not going to give them a, a benefit. So in a, such a situation, when you have a, these kind of the development from the one side, like a new generation of the missiles, or a offensive and defensive missiles, what is the situation comes, this development, such a development, or the development of counterforce, which is a, a if we can just simply use the capability, it stimulates an arms race, it stimulates security dilemma, uh, it also cause st uh, stimulates stability and instability paradox, and at the same time, persisting strategic competition between India and Pakistan. Theoretically and practically, all these four factors, they are once or entire to the deterrent stability, or I can say strategic stability. So in such a situation, when you introduce the counterforce, definitely it, it germinates or it leads to us a situation where the strategic stability in South Asia would be transformed into strategic instability. Similarly, it also ca caused the deterrence riddle because of the reason is that the, uh, the deterrence riddle in South Asia is identified uh, intensified because India is uh, taking a lead in introducing new kinds of the missiles, which is also disturbing the current delicate balance in South Asia. And if there is a disturbance of a balance of terror or a balance of power, where the balance will be shifted, indicator is, <coughs> indicators are that the balance of power may shift in India's favor. And if the Moody is there, he will not going to waste a minute to, you can say, benefit from that balance of, balance of power, <coughs> which will be a, a balance, imbalance, which is, will be in his favor. Why I'm saying <coughs> that in such a situation, when you focus, you would find that the counterforce potential encourages launching a decapitating nuclear first strike. The fear of first strike becomes more plausible if the chairman of the National Command Authority or head of the government, which is normally or in India is head of the government, is ideologically extremist and habitual in using war rhetoric, uh, using war rhetoric and sporadic violence as a mean to muster popular support to win the election. That is why also here fear that next year, 2024, April, May is a, again general election month of the India. So we have to be very watchful that maybe such kind of attempt made like a 2016 to win the UP in 2017 election, 2019 to win the general election. So how we can ignore. So in a conclusion, I can submit that the Indian and Pakistani military buildup creates an enormous spiral in the offensive and defensive arms race and telling a strategic environment which is immensely complex, volatile, and unpredictable.
India's second my point here is India's counterforce temptation has the potential to destabilize South Asian strategic stability. And my final submission is to counter the perceived Indian nuclear threat, Pakistan needs to continuously review its nuclear capability and readjust its nuclear posture to make it more reliable and flexible. Thank you very much.